Do we live in what the philosopher Gilles Deleuze calls a control society? Is the networked nature of the contemporary media a characteristic feature of societies of control? Or does the current loss of faith in capitalist neoliberalism signal the societies of control are now, in fact, in crisis? Deleuze's 1990 essay Postscript on the Societies of Control is concerned with the transition from Michel Foucault's disciplinary societies to what Deleuze calls societies of control. Disciplinary societies are characterised by vast closed environments, each with their own laws, through which the individual ceaselessly passes one to the other, the family, school, barracks, factory, and, depending on circumstances, the hospital. Above all, it's the prison, however, which serves as the analogical model for the closed system of disciplinary societies. These environments or enclaves are about enclosure and confinement. Their project is to concentrate, to distribute in space, order in time, administer life. For Deleuze, disciplinary societies reached their peak at the beginning of the 20th century. His contention is that just as Foucault saw disciplinary societies as having superseded societies of sovereignty, so, in a process that has accelerated after World War II, social organisation today has now ceased to be disciplinary. So much so that all the closed set spaces associated with disciplinary societies are in crisis. The family is in crisis, the health service is in crisis, the factory system is in crisis all of which appears quite recognisable today, of course. What's even more interesting, as far as the contemporary situation is concerned, is that all attempts by government to reform the confined environments of the disciplinary societies are in vain. No matter how long these bounded spaces may linger, no matter how long their death throes may be, ultimately, they are finished for Deleuze. Disciplinary societies are supposedly in the process of being replaced by societies of control. The latter are our immediate future, according to Deleuze in this essay, and Foucault, if Deleuze is to be believed, and contain extremely rapid, free-floating forms of continuous control and instant communication that operate in environments and spaces that are much more open. As a result, Whereas the enclaves of disciplinary societies are like different moulds or castings which shape individuals, the mechanisms of the societies of control are a modulation like a self-deforming cast that will continuously change from one moment to the other. Instead of the prison or factory of disciplinary societies, we now have the corporation which is likened to a spirit, a gas. Deleuze puts it like this, the factory constituted individuals as a single body to the double advantage of the boss who surveyed each element within the mass and the unions who mobilised a mass resistance, but the corporation constantly presents the brashest rivalry as a healthy form of emulation, an excellent motivational force that opposes individuals against one another and runs through each, dividing each within. What's more, this is the case not just with regard to the corporation, but also the school and the university, we'd argue. Here too, perpetual training reigns via the introduction of an audit culture, evaluation forms, performance-related pay, and other forms of never-ending monitoring and micromanagement, with continuous control, for which we can read continuous assessment, training, and staff development, replacing the examination. In a control-based system, nothing's left alone for long, Deleuze maintains elsewhere. Like the school, according to Deleuze then, the university has been handed over to the corporation. It's becoming less and less a closed site differentiated from the workspace as another closed site. That said, it's not a matter of one form of society being more powerful than the other, disciplinary as opposed to control societies, both types containing liberating and enslaving forces that confront one another. So there's no need to fear or hope for Deleuze, only to look for new weapons. Although written in 1990, 
Deleuze's essay seems surprisingly topical and current today. Nowhere more so, perhaps, than when he describes the transition from the capitalism of the past to that of the present. It's worth quoting him at length on this point. 19th century capitalism is a capitalism of concentration, for production and for property. It therefore erects a factory as a space of enclosure, the capitalist being the owner of the means of production, but also progressively the owner of the other spaces conceived through analogy, the worker's familial house, the school. As for markets, they are conquered sometimes by specialization, sometimes by colonization, sometimes by lowering the cost of production. But in the present situation, capitalism is no longer involved in production, which it often relegates to the third world. It's a capitalism of higher order production. It no longer buys raw materials and no longer sells the finished products. It buys the finished products or assembles parts. What it wants to sell is services, but what it wants to buy is stocks. This is no longer a capitalism for production, but for the product, which is to say, for being sold or marketed. Thus it is essentially dispersive, and the factory is given way to the corporation. The family, the school, the army, the factory are no longer the distinct analogical spaces that converge towards an owner, state or private power, but coded figures, deformable and transformable, of a single corporation that now has only stockholders. The conquests of the market are made by grabbing control and no longer by disciplinary training. Corruption thereby gains a new power. Marketing has become the centre of the soul of the corporation. We are taught that corporations have a soul, which is the most terrifying news in the world. The operation of markets is now the instrument of social control and forms the impudent breed of our masters. Control is short term and of rapid rates of turnover but also continuous and without limit, while discipline was of long duration, infinite and discontinuous. Man is no longer man enclosed, but man in debt. With this, Deleuze's postscript on the societies of control appears to announce not just the fate of the corporation and with it the university, it also anticipates the current credit crunch and global financial crisis. A crisis of belief in the promise of capital, a fall from capitalism to creditalism, as well as events such as the recent protests outside British factories against the import of foreign workers from Europe. Is the current financial crisis a symptom of the crisis of disciplinary societies, or is it the operation of the markets and hence, since the markets are now the instrument of control, the societies of control themselves that are in crisis? And if it's the control societies that are in crisis, could we follow Deleuze's lead and try to predict what form of society is going to come after the societies of control? Would this be an interesting and useful thing to do? In a recent lecture in London, the philosopher Bernard Stiegler appeared to be attempting just something of this kind. He suggested that we're faced by two possible future scenarios, Either control intensifies in the sense explained by Deleuze, or industrial capitalism passes from the consumerist economy of the societies of control to what Stiegler calls an economy of contribution. Yet this analysis only begs a host of further questions. Can these two economies, the consumer economy and the economy of contribution, be so easily opposed as Stiegler seems to imply? Can even disciplinary societies and the societies of control be so easily contrasted? Didn't forms of what Deleuze refers to as control exist in disciplinary societies and vice versa? Are the institutions of the disciplinary society really finished? Everywhere? Isn't this too linear and straightforward a model of development? Don't some societies in other spaces and places around the world still rely on the deployment of disciplinary technologies of power and production and so on? Presumably, these are the very third world countries Deleuze argues control societies have outsourced their production to. And if that's so, doesn't control rely on and support a disciplinary and disciplined other? Don't even some aspects of our own society still rely on disciplinary technologies? not least the prison system. 
Surely the deterrent of incarceration relies on its break from the more quotidian flow of controlling forces in our lives. It relies upon its distinctive disciplinary powers. Coming back to Stiegler's idea of an economy of contribution, the thought also occurs that if people are to have their contributions to this new economy acknowledged, so they know they have contributed, as he insists, then surely this would still be part of the conventional economy of debt and exchange, in which case it wouldn't be a particularly new or different form of economy at all. There's certainly nothing particularly new about the way one feature of society, in Stiegler's case, the degree of participation that is perceived as being afforded by much contemporary computer-aided communication, is being singled out here, privileged and then used to provide an explanation of the nature of society as such. Although the particular machinic metaphor that is being drawn on may be different, for Stiegler it's the kind of contribution commonly associated with the digital culture of Web 2.0, rather than anything to do with the clock, steam, engine, or petrol motors say, this way of conceptually modelling the world using the dominant machinic metaphors of a given era is quite an old one now. One conceptual metaphor may have been replaced with another, but the relation between that metaphor and the conceptual model of the world is much the same. There's nothing that's really all that different here as far as the structure of analysis is concerned. The meaning of the world is still being read off the dominant mode of technology in a given era, with each kind of society corresponding to a particular kind of machine, as Deleuze has it in control and becoming. Now in this interview with Negri, Deleuze acknowledges that machines don't explain anything. You have to analyse the collective arrangements of which the machines are just one component, albeit an apparently privileged one. Still, it's noticeable that on this evidence, both of these theorists, Deleuze and Stiegler, seem to be extremely confident in their ability to access these collective arrangements. The nature of social reality may have changed to the extent that it can now be said to be based more around the kind of production associated with control societies and their enterprises, as Maurizio Lazzarato calls them, than it is with the factories of Fordism modernism and disciplinary societies. But on this evidence, the ability of philosophers or social theorists to access and analyse this reality clearly has not undergone anything like such a profound transformation. Does all this point us towards something that, in different ways, can be said to be a feature of both Stiegler's talk and Deleuze's text? For even though Greg Siegeworth positions the current Deleuzean boom in cultural studies and cultural theory in terms of a certain collective exhaustion of post-structuralist trajectories, isn't there something that is actually rather structuralist about the analysis of both Stiegler and Deleuze here? Witness their apparent interest in uncovering the underlying system of things and bringing to light and rendering visible the structural principles arrangements and relationships at the heart of society, as it were. Witness too the reliance of both of these thinkers on what appear to be rather simple sets of structuring binaries, consumption versus contribution, discipline versus control, factory versus corporation, body versus gas, machine versus computer, not to mention the grand narratives of almost linear historical development and progression they appear to provide. Without doubt, there is something very persuasive and seductive about all this, but there is also something reductive about it as well. In their use of grand narratives and machinic metaphors, could analysis of this kind not be said to tell us almost as much, if not more, about the will to power and knowledge of their authors and those who follow in their footsteps and attempt to build on their foundations, as they do contemporary societies? In this respect, it's a relatively easy matter, perhaps too easy, to come up with explanations as to why a text such as Postscript on the Societies of Control has been taken up and used so readily within the social sciences and social theory especially. It meets a need for large explanations of contemporary societies, the workings of which can otherwise often appear too ambiguous, complex and difficult to grasp. 
explanations that have an added advantage in that they can also be contrasted to previous structuralist, post or otherwise, theories, thus helping the user to feel as if they are, indeed, very much at the cutting edge of some fashionable, new Deleuzean paradigm. Or is such an explanation itself too simplistic and reductive in turn? Take the way Deleuze with his comments about a continuous network, about codes that mark access to information and reject it, and about surfing, has frequently been drawn upon to say something about the internet and the network nature of contemporary society. That the internet is a characteristic feature of societies of control. For Deleuze, whereas the old societies of sovereignty made use of simple machines, levers, pulleys, clocks, the societies of control operate with machines of a third type, computers. In this sense, it would be a fairly simple matter to position the ink on paper codex book as belonging to disciplinary societies. In the disciplinary societies, one was always starting again, from book to book to book. Our liquid book would then presumably belong to societies of control with their continuous variation without limit. After all, one can finish a codex book and start a new one, but one can never finish a liquid book, neither in terms of reading it nor writing it. Rather, it too is part of a continuous network, the corporation, the educational system, the armed services being metastable states coexisting in one and the same modulation, like a universal system of deformation. Nor does this necessarily have to be a negative thing, for how does one combat the gaseous or liquid nature of the corporation or university in the societies of control? Is political struggle now to be conducted with forms of resistance that are fixed and solid? Or should the gaseous enterprise be combated with new forms of resistance, creativity and struggle that are similarly spirit, gas or liquid life in nature, more tactical than strategic, and which are therefore likewise subject to continuous change and modulation? If so, how is such an emphasis on creating and on being open to the new and unexpected to be distinguished from neoliberal capitalism's emphasis on continual innovation and creativity? It's here that questions of ethics and politics come into play. It's where we would argue we are required to make responsible ethical and political decisions in specific, albeit undecidable, situations and circumstances. After all, creativity is not inherently political or ethical at all. Some forms of creativity are more ethical or political than others, depending on the particular situation and context. In this respect, given our concern with raising questions for notions of intellectual property, copyright and so forth with the Liquid Book Project, it's interesting that while Deleuze spends very little time in this essay investigating precisely what the new weapons we would use against the control societies are, of the two, he does mention computer piracy as one, the other being introduction of viruses. Nevertheless, Deleuze was writing pre the World Wide Web as we currently know and understand it. So is there a question mark concerning the extent to which Deleuze is actually able to tell us something about the web? Might the web not have followed a line of flight away from the concept of control in the intervening years? Is there a danger that using this concept to interpret the web will not only run counter to Deleuze's emphasis on creativity and experimentation, as opposed to representation, by saying, this is that, but will in effect result in an attempt to discipline the web in order to make it more like Deleuze's philosophy, as when people talk about digital media with its binary code allowing the modulation of a fixed structure or grid that might never be finally escaped. After all, if the web is today still as Deleuze described things in this essay, then there can have been precious little actual modulation or continuous change since 1990. Or is that the point, that there has been change and modulation, but it's within a fixed structure or grid? And how appropriate is the concept of control when it comes to thinking about the web anyway? What about the question Mark Poster raises in his essay on who controls digital culture? Can digital culture actually be controlled in the conventional sense? 
Isn't the very term control a rather awkward one to use in this context? Isn't it too much of a feature of forms of society that existed before those of control Deleuze is referring to? Certainly one of the things that is both interesting and surprising about a lot of Deleuze's writing, and it's a feature of this essay on control societies, is its vagueness and the lack of subtlety in some of the ideas and language, or should that be openness? For example, we know this is part and parcel of Deleuze being creative, that it's about experiencing and experimenting rather than interpreting. You know, in science one speaks of a control group and an experimental group, the latter only being possible because of its relation to the former. So there's clearly a link here between control and experiment. But it's interesting that so many responses to Deleuze's postscript on the societies of control do seem to attempt to represent or interpret it, say this means that, rather than experiment with it. Now the generous response would of course be to say that this occurs because such interpretations are part of the very system of control and interpretation Deleuze is trying to combat, perhaps using this essay as some form of modest weapon. But one last question that remains concerns Deleuze's own responsibility in all this. Is there a case to be made that it's too easy for texts such as Postscript on the Society of Self Control to be picked up and adopted in rather unsubtle and uninteresting ways? Or is this, in fact, one of the reasons Deleuze's essay has proved so influential?